and we can slowly start. So yeah, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Samuel Horvat and I'm one of the organizer of Flow Seminar along with Peter Richtarik, Virginia Smith, Averlyn Bellet and Dan Alistair. So for those of you joining for the first time, for learning, uh, Flow stands for Fairy Learning One More Seminar. That was created to provide some kind of a global online forum for the dissemination of uh, the latest scientific research in all the aspects of fairy learning. And today we have, I believe, 64th Flow Talk. And it was, it's my great pleasure to introduce you our speaker, uh, John Guyan, who is a research engineer at Meta AI, a previous Facebook AI, where he focuses on fairy learning and privacy preserving machine learning. And today he's going to tell us more about practical federated learning with asynchronous aggregation. So yeah, thank you, John, again, for agreeing to give a talk. And please, yeah, stage is yours. You're muted, John. Thank you, Samuel. Bye. Yeah, so today uh, I'll talk about kind of two papers uh, a lot in this talk. Uh, the first is kind of the federated learning with buffer asynchronous aggregation. Uh, which is more a, an algorithm and theory paper. And then uh, also talk about the papaya, practical, private, and scalable federal learning. Uh, this paper uh, describes our production stack uh, and how we deploy uh, our algorithm to uh, millions of uh, real devices. Uh, and all this would not be possible without my colleagues at Meta AI or Facebook AI. Uh, and this work uh, I'm presenting is uh, the work of many. Okay, so with that, um, let's talk about what this talk is about. Um, so this is an overview. First, we'll kind of talk about the flavors and modalities of FL so that we have a, a common terminology for the rest of the talk. Then we'll describe some of the uh, federal learning challenges that we face at scale uh, and, and talk about some design choices and priorities what we think that we need to think about when designing a better learning system. Uh, and then we'll talk about FedBuff, which is the algorithm in the, the paper and how FedBuff uh, solve these uh, the design challenges in, in, um, uh, at scale. And lastly, uh, we'll talk about the results that we see in uh, our the production deployment. Okay. Um, all right, so let's start. Flavors and modalities of FL. All right, before we begin, it's important to kind of understand the different flavors uh, so that we can identify the problems uh, associated with each flavor. Um, so since I'm at Facebook, sorry, sorry. So, the first flavor is cross silo. Uh, cross silo is kind of like FL across several large institutions. You can think of it as uh, kind of FL across multiple hospitals, banks, um, and, and so forth. Um, so the there are few institutions, but each institution has a lot of data. So this is cross silo. The next uh, is going to be cross device. This is the uh, FL cross many edge devices. So um, where the edge devices can be the phones, the glasses, smart glasses, uh, or a smart watch. Uh, well, in this case, there are many uh, devices where each device has various compute power and various uh, data volume. Uh, and so the focus of this talk uh, for today and the setting what we care about is going to be a uh, cross device. Uh, that's going to be our focus. Okay, modalities of FL. Uh, just some terminology. So the first modality, the first mode is synchronous FL. Uh, in this case, uh, the server waits for all clients to come in. Uh, the server selects in uh, a cohort or an, an X number of clients per round. They wait for all the clients to come in before taking a server step. A, a classic example of this is uh, Fed averaging and pretty much, uh, I would say 90% of all algorithms in FL is synchronous. 
then another another modality is fully asynchronous FL. So in this case, uh, the server doesn't wait for all the clients in the round to come in. Uh, the server updates its server model uh, as client responses come in. Um, in this case, we trade we trade uh, some of the we trade this so we, we, we gain speed, but we also take in uh, we also have staleness because in an asynchronous approach, uh, client responses can init be initialized with a previous uh, server model. So those are the two modes. Let's let's talk about these in more details. So synchronous FL. Here we have time in the horizontal axis and concurrency here, which is the number of client training parallel. Uh, in this example, uh, we just use four for our simplicity. Uh, and we have to devise A, B, C, D, and E. They both start training with the same initial model. Device D is the fastest one, finishes first. Device E, unfortunately, it drops out because you know, clients uh, are flaky. Uh, they can be interrupted at any given point in time by the user, so it drops out. At that point, we need to replace the, the client with a new user, device C. Uh, and they come in, come in, come in. At, at, at Once we have reached our clients per round target, uh, which is going to be four, then the server will then take a new uh, server step, producing a new model, model M1. Now we can see that device A is the slowest device, um, and this device is going to dominate how long it's going to take for the server to close a round. Um, and that's one of the problems with Sigma SFL. All right, the next is um, fully asynchronous. Here we have uh, concurrency equal to four. Again, it's the number of clients training in parallel. Uh, time horizontally and the same number of devices training, four. Here in this case, uh, the server takes uh, a, a server step as soon as a client response come in. Um, so client C is gonna be the first one to finish. The first, the server immediately take that client response and produce a new model update. Okay. Um, and in this case, it doesn't matter if uh, if uh, a, a client drop out because we just don't really wait or kind of selects new. We just don't really wait for the clients, and it's more tolerant tolerant to kind of device drop out and. The, uh, the closing the speed of the server update is independent of the client training speed. All right, now with that, uh, let's talk about a, the federal learning challenges that we face at scale. Okay, so what keeps me up at night um, with cross-device FL? The first is system and data heterogeneity. Um, so, like we said, the edge devices have widely different compute power. Uh, each device can have different data volume, uh, and, this, and this can complicate things. Uh, next is going to be privacy, right? We use FL, we, we love FL because it provides privacy to our users. Uh, and privacy is the core tenet, and we want to protect the privacy of users as best we can. Uh, and next is massively distributed, uh, right? In cross-device, there are millions and billions of devices, and we need to be able to scale up our algorithm and our stack to, to accommodate this, um, this massively distributed scale. All right, let's dive deeper into each problem. Okay, what I mean by heterogeneity? In this figure, uh, from our production deployment uh, on actually um, real Android phones, uh, plots the distribution of the client execution time. Okay. From first glance, it doesn't seem so bad. Um, but you have to see that the x-axis is in log scale. So this means that the 50th percentile and the 99th percentile is different by one order of magnitude. Um, 
this is show that you know the the hedging entity problem is real and is what exactly what we see from our production deployment. Okay, then privacy, right? So a recent work makes a, the point of privacy very clear. That on the left uh, is the ground truth image, and on the right is the reconstructed image from the federal learning model updates. This should show that gradient inversion attacks can recover uh, the original training data from the model updates. And the model updates itself are as sensitive as raw data. So the argument of just using federal learning and that's it doesn't fly and, and doesn't give uh, a very good privacy protection. Okay, and massively distributed, right? Uh, across the device, that there is a large population size. Uh, the population size can grow over time as new user can join the apps uh, and join the platform. And at any point given point in time, uh, their small population, small fraction of the population uh, can, can be available for FL training. And specifically at Facebook, we have 2.81 billion daily active users. And they, this is the population size that we need to accommodate and be able to leverage. I think we have a question, Samuel. Yes, yeah. So I'll, I'll try and meet first Constantin. So Constantin, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so can we return back for two slides before? And can you give a context about this picture, uh, about what program or task are we talking about? Is it next word prediction? And also, what is a program? Is it like Facebook standalone application or some another project? Right. Yeah. So this this is a uh, language um, uh, modeling task, so the next word prediction task. Uh, and the problem is, uh, yeah, like we said, it's just the next word prediction task. I didn't catch the last part of your question, though. Okay, thank you. And uh, in this uh, experiment, how many people are involved? Yeah, so in this experiment, there are 100 million uh, users enrolled. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, so I'll also try to unmute Abdul Monam. So please go ahead. Yeah, in, in a full uh, synchronous scenario, uh, when, the, when will the server update clients with the new aggregated average? Yeah. Will the server update the clients, update, update clients with a new aggregated average? Oh, when? Right. So um, in this case, uh, it will update the client as soon as, that, as possible. So right here, uh, for example, let's take a look at device I. This client comes in, checks in with the server to start training. The server will give it model M1, as that is the latest model it, it can. Whereas if you take a look at device E, this device will be given device uh, will be given model uh, M0. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Uh, all right. So with those challenges in mind, let's talk about kind of the design choices and priorities that we want to think about. All right. What do we care about when designing an FL system? Okay. Our number one priority is yeah, privacy. Uh, without privacy, we just don't need FL and we can just collect data and go home. We can train it on a server. The second priority is walk on clear training time. FL is orders of magnitude slower than centralized training. Uh, and from our experience, an FL task can take more than five days to complete. Our third priority is uh, client resources, right? Edge devices have limited compute power and communication capabilities. Therefore, we want to design a system where we use as little of client resources as possible in order to, to, to reach uh, some target model quality. So those are three goals. Let's talk about them individually now. So first, let's talk about privacy. 
As we mentioned before, model updates can be sensitive uh, as raw data. So given this privacy concern, secure aggregation has emerged as a standard security protocol, which ensures that the central server may only see the final sum of the model updates rather than any individual update by itself. Thus, this information is learned from the aggregated model update may not be attributed to any specific user. This uh, offers uh, an extra layer of privacy against the central server. Uh, so in this figure, um, the server broadcasts the model to the, the edge devices, the client computes its local updates, and sends back to the server. But here is an extra step. We have a secure aggregation layer, which uh, securely aggregate all the client updates. And, what get, and the server only gets the final sum of all the, all the updates, not the individual updates itself. And the process repeats. Um, so this kind of helps against the gradient inversion attacks or have um, and, and give the extra layer of privacy here. All right, so with that, there are two flavors of secure aggregation. Uh, the first is the SMPC secure aggregation by Bonowitz and all in 2017. Uh, in this version, uh, each client exchange uh, its uh, peer a chain would always appear a random mask. It is aided by the server. The client then sends the server uh, their update plus all the sum of all the mask that they have distributed. The server then collects the client updates, the shares, and add them up and recover the sum of all the client updates. Uh, so this is kind of a simplified version of the SMPC approach. There is another approach uh, which rely on trusted execution environment, or T for short. Uh, a, trusted, uh, a trusted execution environment is a secure area within the main processor, right? In this area, the only, it only allows for code and the data to run. Uh, in this way, the content of the enclave, or the secure um, environment, cannot be read uh, except in its encrypted form by any external process and, and not even the operating system itself. So everything, ha whatever happens within a T is private and what you see is what the T going to output. Okay, so by using secure aggregation with T, we, we, we don't have to exchange masks. The clients don't have to exchange masks with each other. And there's no need to form a cohort or a round. Uh, making this approach very attractive for asynchronous FL. Uh, so, you know, in T, uh, it's more suited for asynchronous FL because cohort only matters in retrospect. Uh, it only matters at the end where, when the server needs to uh, com aggregate uh, um, all the client updates and produce a final sum. Okay, with that. Let's talk about uh, walk clock training time uh, and the next priority that we have. So the straggler problem uh, is a well-known problem in veteran learning. Again, we have this figure of client execution time. Uh, and instead, we have now we have two lines, the mean client execution time and the mean round duration, which is how 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 long it takes for the server to close a single round. And we can see that the round completion time depends on the slowest client. Is that the end of the tail end of the distribution? Right, so this highlights the straggler problem that we face. What is the possible solution for this? The first it can be a timeout, right? So we the server can enforce a timeout on each client and tell the client to uh, train for, say, X number of, as, uh, of minutes, two minutes, or so, for instance. And after that, the clients get cut off and reports back what they have. Um, however, wherever we place the timeout, that's going to be the round duration. So if we were to place timeout at here, which we did, that's going to be the round duration. We don't enforce a timeout at all. We have unbounded client execution. And we just don't really know when the client will come back. 
So in a practical setting, a timeout will always be enforced uh, to us to place some constraint on when we the client uh, actually has to come back. So if you were to, um, you know, so picking a timeout threshold is difficult uh, without knowing kind of the client execution time beforehand. Sorry, Jim, uh, there is a question from Constantine. So let me just mm -hmm. unmute him. So go ahead, Constantine. Thank you. Uh, can you please specify what is, uh, what do you mean by slowest? Is it slowest uh, uh, because the client uh, has slow channel or because uh, he has slow computation mm -hmm. device? Of course, if you look into such good world. Yeah, so we don't have kind of this metadata about like why the client is slow. Uh, and we, so that, you know, this client can be slow because it has a lot of training data and which we will kind of uh, talk about in later in the talk. Uh, generally, clients with more data are slower. Uh, also, this client can have a combination of a lot of training data, but also a uh, kind of an older phone, which makes compute uh, lost less. So that could be uh, it. Yeah, hopefully I answered your question. I see. Yeah, thank you. Also, one more question regarding the server. So server from the previous slides for MPC protocol that you are using, is it kind of conceptual server or it is a real server? The server it uses for the SMPC protocol. Is it a yeah, conceptual so server? It's conceptual server, yes. Yes. Uh, in in this in this yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So possible solutions. Talk about timeout. Might have how that is implemented, but you know, if we're placing a timeout is difficult. The next is over selection, uh, and it's proposed by Bonnet in 2019. And let's talk about over selection. Over selection selects 30% more clients than the target clients per round and waits for the fastest to come in and drops the rest. Okay. So here we have client execution time on the X axis again. Um, but we have two, two, uh, two settings. One is sync FL with over selection, which is the yellow. And sync FL without order selection, which is the blue, where we wait for all the clients to come in. And we can clearly see that over selection drops the client with slower execution time as we would expect. Uh, however, I have to talk about in many papers that clients with slow execution time is correlated with clients with many examples. And in this figure, uh, we have the number of examples per client uh, on the x-axis. And notice here that the scale is four orders of magnitude y. So number of examples is even greater. Uh, again, this is for a language modeling task. So an example would be a word. And clients with slow, with uh, many examples are slow clients. So oh, what over selection is doing is that it drops client with many examples. And this introduces some sort of bias. Okay, so let's dive deeper into what is the bias uh, introduced by over selection. Here we have two settings. Uh, one is FL, uh, that is just FL uh, with no over selection. We wait for all clients to come in. And FL with 30% over selection as um, FL, we select 30% more clients and wait for the fastest response. And if you were to take a look at the time, it's dramatic. Uh, FL, wait for all clients to come in, is dominated by the stragglers effect, and it's very slow. 
Um, and in, in this case, we basically, our, our stopping condition is uh, we train on 1 million clients. And after a million clients, we stop. And we see how long it takes for each task to complete, uh, to, to go over a million clients. And in, in, in vanilla FL, is going to be 130 hours. And FL with over selection is 19 hours. That's all in great. But if you take a look at the perplexity, so perplexity is a measure of how well a language model predicts the sample. Uh, so the lower is the better. The average perplexity between the two is different, but not is not uh, not something to that stands out. Uh, sync with, I mean, FL with over selection is slightly worse uh, on average compared to if we just wait for all the clients. So there's some sort of bias here, but. The difference is not as drastic if we were to take a look at the top 25 or top one percentile. So here, top 25, top one means clients in the with number of examples in the top 25 percentile. So basically, clients with many examples. But we're trying to see how well the model pre uh, predicts, how well the model will perform for clients with many examples, clients in the tele and the distribution. And take a look at the top one percent. The difference is drastic. So since over selection drops all the clients with many examples, they just never get trained. So the perplexity is much, much worse compared to vanilla FL where we wait for all the clients. So here in this case, we're trading training speed for model quality and fairness. All right. So I see a question. Um, I'll just answer from the chat. Then. What ML models are you training in dimension FL fashion? So this is a uh, two-layer LSTM on a language modeling task. Um, and I think this is the same type of workload that uh, the work by uh, towards uh, credit learning at scale, I believe, uh, by Juan Watson in 2019. Uh, the same workload as, as at their paper. All right, moving on to how to train faster, right? So this figure shows the relationship between uh, concurrency. Concurrency here is number of training uh, clients training in parallel again on the x-axis, and on the y-axis is the number of hours to reach a target loss. So we set a target loss. I'm just trying to see how long it would take for each uh, configuration to reach that target loss and record a number of hours. So we start out with 100 and I'll increase all the way to 2,600. So how many clients training in parallel? And we can see that increasing concurrency, like increasing parallelism speeds up training. Um, and uh, the fastest configuration is going to be the one uh, that has the highest concurrency. All right, see another question. Uh, hi, in certain use cases, could you imagine wanting to, to still include very slow clients? For instance, if those are very old phones belonging to a particular part of the population, we want to represent in data. What lever can you pull to trade up in speed and model quality? Yep, so that's a very good question. So yes, we do we do want to incorporate all the clients as possible. Uh, and, and this is very crucial to having better, uh, better model quality. So what lever can we do? And I, we'll talk about how kind of uh, the approach or, or, or approach we aim to solve this. Uh, for Sync FL, I, I don't think there is any practical that, uh, lever that we can do right now, uh, at least in the, at least that we can deploy into production. They, I think there has been papers uh, trying to solve this in the, in the sickness world, but deploying to production, I have not seen that. Uh, and we'll, so we'll talk about how we solve this problem uh, later in the talk. All right, All right, so increase in currency, again, concurrency here, number of chronic training parallel, Increase in currency speeds up training. 
and the fastest configuration is going to be the one with the highest concurrency. All right. So some recap. Stragglers, slow down training, All right? Seen that before. Increase in currency can speed up training, uh, speed up training time. So we want to be able to use as high of concurrency as possible. Uh, and since we have 2.81 billion users, you know, increase we can we can have concurrency be very high. Oh. Okay. All right. Next. Let's talk about client resources. And I want to introduce you the large concurrency problem. So SyncFL not only suffer from stragglers, it also suffer from the large concurrency problem. And this has been highlighted by Charles Nell in 2021, where they highlighted his problem. And so what is a large concurrency problem? Large concurrency problem mirrors the issues in large batch training. In SyncFL, the effective batch size is the same as the concurrency level. So if we were to choose concurrency equal to 2,000, that's going to be the batch size of, that, of the server step. So on the x-axis, the concurrency level. On the y-axis is the number of client updates. So client updates here is a client, uh, one unit of client update here is a client downloading a model from the server, uh, runs one pass over its local data and upload their update back to the server. So that, that's one unit of client update. This measures the uh, resource consumption by the client that, by, um, that we need or uh, to, to reach a, a target loss. So this figure measures the number of client updates to reach a target loss, which measures how much client resources do we use. Um, so as we can see, the more, the higher the concurrency, the higher the effective batch size in SyncFL, the more client resources we need to reach the same, and it's the key, the same target loss. So we can basically achieve more or less the same client resources by using very low concurrency. However, as we've seen before, low concurrency is very slow. We want to be here to, in order to speed up training. So the so takeaway here is increase in currency speeds up training by using much more client resources. All right. So with that, we kind of have this problem. Uh, let's protect user privacy. We want to speed up walk-up training time and save on client resources. However, uh, we have kind of have to choose two, two out of three in the traditional uh, synchronous approach. So this begs the question that we need to rethink how we approach FL, not with a synchronous approach, but more in an asynchronous way. And this is where FetBuff come in. FetBuff is a uh, better learning with buffer asynchronous aggregation. So this is not fully asynchronous, it's buffer asynchronous. And let me describe the algorithm in details. Here, here is a, a pseudocode of the FetBuff server. Uh, let's start out with line two. Uh, the server selects a client to start training. The client will then run its local training loop, and this can be uh, the same as uh, any federal learning task. If the server, then in, in the, these happen asynchronously, and um, then the server, um, if the, they receive a client update, then it's kind of aggregate the, the, the update to it running some within a, a, a T, as we talk about, increment our buffer side counter, and once we reach k, a, a, a predetermined buffer size. The server then aggregates and, and I mean, average the, 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 the client updates and take a server, a server step and update its model. And the process repeats. The key distinction here is that uh, the client sampling is happened 
asynchronously. Uh, it is not it is not happening uh, uh, synchronously as SyncFL. Another distinction compared to fully asynchronous FL is that there is a buffer size. And this is a tunable parameter where we can determine how many clients do we want in the buffer, or this is this kind of determines our effective batch size. So we are decoupling the client sampling step and the uh, the server update step from each other. Okay, let's dive a little bit deeper and we see this diagram again, but this time for the FedBuff protocol. Concurrency here again is four, number of clients training in parallel, and we have time horizontally. Here, since FedBuff is a asynchronous approach, um, clients can come in. Here in this case, client C comes in. It will get aggregated into a buffer. And the server here waits for the buffer to be full, which it will be, where device B comes in before taking a server step. So in this case, uh, we don't update the server model as soon as any client come in. We wait for a specific buffer size, number of clients to come in, which is two here in this case, before we actually taking uh, a, a, uh, a server step. So uh, how do we kind of uh, initialize new clients come in? Here, device E comes in. Since model M0 is the latest, it will be given model M0 as its initialized model. Um, so in uh, any kind of asynchronous approach, we have to deal with staleness. As we can see here, device I started out when the server model is at M1, but it finishes when the server model already moved on to model M0. So now when this device comes in, its model will be stale, and we have to deal with staleness by uh, re-weighting its, uh, its update. And how to make this private? And we can make the buffer happen, the buffer aggregation happens within a T, uh, within a T by having more than one client uh, uh, in the buffer, we can mask the client update with each other uh, and, and basically the server will only see the final sum of the buffer, not the individual client update in the buffer itself. So this, this way, we are able to make FedBuff, an asynchronous protocol, uh, compatible with secure aggregation. I'll pause here if anyone has questions about the, the protocol. Okay, let's move on to uh, what we see in our deployment at scale. And this is gonna be um, our result from our production launch. Okay, how do we train faster? Um, we can see here that FEPBUF is much faster at high concurrency. So Y-axis, the number of hours to reach a target loss. X-axis is the concurrency level. For both tasks, for both configuration, uh, increase in currency speeds up training. And so you might ask, why, why is FEPA flat now? And here you can see the scale. It's the faster concurrency reach finishes training in roughly five to seven hours. And we kind of reach the limit of how fast we can um, make the task train because there is a limit on how there's an overhead on how how much the server can ingest and how how fast the 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 server can uh, update its model. And one thing to note here, our buffer size is fixed at a hundred throughout. Therefore, by increasing currency, we also uh, increase the staleness uh, within the system. All right. So FET buff is faster at high currency. Let's take a look at the speed up graph. So here, the y-axis is the speed up relative to sync FL. So the speed up of FedBuff 
gets larger and larger as we increase concurrency. We've seen before, SyncFL has this diminishing returns problem where increasing the number of uh, clients per round or concurrency doesn't speed up uh, training a whole lot. So therefore, FedBook is able to reach the target loss faster and faster as we increase concurrency. All right, so what about client resources? Um, here, the y-axis, number of client updates. Uh, x-axis, the concurrency level. FedBuff does not suffer from the large concurrency problem. As we talk about that there is a decouple uh, link of client sampling and uh, server update step. As we're here, we can keep K, our buffer size equal to 100 throughout, kind of keeping our server step small, our server uh, batch size small. Uh, therefore, we do not suffer from the large batch problem compared to sync FL. And we don't use up more and more resources in order to reach the same concurrency uh, in order to see, reach the same target loss. So basically, uh, we're able to train faster at high concurrency, but also not use up client resources. Sorry, so we basically checks two, two of the boxes that we need. And also we can do um, secure aggregation. So that also checks the privacy aspects. Okay, to understand why FedBuff is faster, let's ask a few questions, uh, one question. Is it faster because of stragglers? Or is it because of the large concurrency problem that we talked about? Or is it because the bias from order selection? Because we drop slow clients, that's why FedBuff is faster. Or is it all of the above? And if you answer all of the above, it's probably the right answer. And let's take a look. Okay, so I know there's a lot, and let's take let's let's dive a little bit deeper. Here on the x-axis is the number of the, the training time, and y-axis is the training loss. So basically, this plots the training curve of a language modeling task on a, a population of 100 million Android phones, uh, we, and we plot the distribution, uh, the training loss curve over time. Let's start with the top. This green line, it's SyncFL without order selection. So this is SyncFL, uh, wait for all clients to come in. The yellow line is SyncFL with over selection. And that is, we select 30% more clients, and wait for the fastest to reply. The blue line is FEFBUFF with K equal to 1,000. So K here is the buffer size. This means that we're taking a large server, uh, we have a large effective batch size. Uh, one thing to note, sync FL, when both configs have uh, clients per round equal to 1,000. So that buff with K equal to 1,000 is the same as, has the same effective batch size as the sync configs. And the red is that buff with K equal to 100, which is uh, the effective batch size equal to 100. Uh, so this gap right here between over selection and, and no over selection, this is from the straggler effect. And that is most of the speed up. And most of the focus in the federal learning literature is how to solve this uh, straggler problem, which is in this gap. But you can see here, that is not all of the speed up. That is just part of the speed up. The next part of speed up is bias from over selection. As we talk about, <clears throat> since FedBuff doesn't drop slow clients, right? It's clients can come in with stale updates, uh, even if it's a slow, and we just downweight that client. So a client, any slow client <clears throat> can participate in training. Uh, that client doesn't get dropped. Therefore, we're able to train faster and be able to reach a better model quality by not dropping slow clients here in FedBuff. And that's one of the lever that we can solve, we can use. It's by using FedBuff. Um, and that's this gap right here. Again, that is also not all. A ne the next gap is from taking small server, uh, 
small, having a small effective batch size. We talk about how in large batch training in, in the centralized setting, uh, having a large batch kind of destabilize the training, uh, training dynamic. So the difference between FEP of K equal 1000 and K equal 100 is from taking small, uh, smaller uh, batch size set. All right, so any question on, on this slide before I move on? Constantine, I think you have a question. Yes, let me just unmute Constantine. Thank you. Yeah, so the, the question about step sizes. So how they have been selected for these experiments? Are they the same for the buff, simple fail, or you tune this for the way I understand that you mentioned? And also, how, how sensitive are uh, this algorithm for step size selection? Are they diverged sometimes? So, can you? I, mean, I I respect that it is hard to train to wear LSTM like in models, uh, but can you maybe share some observations right. about how sensitive for step sizes your experiments are? Right. So, yeah, since, since this is a real deployment on actual uh, Android phones, uh, we couldn't really tune hyperparameters. Uh, so, what we did is we, in simulation on some proxy data, uh, we tune uh, for the best uh, learning rates for all the methods, uh, tune for the best client learning rate and also the best server learning rate. At the server, to, to answer your question about uh, decaying step size, at the server, we use Fed Atom. Uh, so Atom at the optimizer for the for Fed Buff and Sync FL. Um, so kind of Atom takes care of the decaying step sizes uh, automatically. Um, <clears throat> so do you so have guarantees that it will not blow, blow up? I mean, uh, because for like for convex, strongly convex cases, uh, there is a rigid theory for convergence. Uh, and for at least for my papers for SML, I'm not producing experiments that are working really in deployment setting. So for neural net experiments, unfortunately, I have to tune step sizes. Uh, and your strategy, does it guarantee that all will be okay? So uh, so we do tune step size uh, in, in, in simulation, and we use that step size uh, to, in, in, the, in the deployment. Uh, can we guarantee that that step size works and you know, not blow up in the real deployment? No, we can't do that, but uh, that's the best that we, that we kind of have. Yeah, thank you. Oh, sorry, <laughs> last question. Just, I'm just curious so uh maybe to the end but like i will ask right now so uh you uh, the, it was a question regarding uh modeling uh, modeling step and you have used uh, two layer lstm or network mm -hmm. uh have you considered uh, using classical machine learning methods like linear regression but coupled with the feature extractor like trained lstm or trained cnn so because for Convex setting and strongly convex setting, uh, we have methods with a strong theory guarantees if it is needed. Mm -hmm. So, the, the, <clears throat> oh, 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 I mean, did you consider this uh, modeling assumption or you immediately go to two layers of STM? Right, reason? so, can you have right, right. Right, that makes sense. So basically, we asked like we can use a, a feature extractor and have some like a uh, linear layer on top uh, instead yeah. of having uh, the train a full SDM. Yeah, yeah, we did consider that. And the reason why we use a two-layer SDM or an LCM model is because we want to replicate the same setup used by uh, Bonowitz and all in 2019, which uh, which way I did describe how 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 they deploy it in in production. That, that's that's the the. The only other paper that kind of describe a, a production deployment, but you're right, and that, that, that is totally possible in order to to, to use a feature extractor in a linear layer. Stefan has a question. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to unmute him. Please, Stefan, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi, John. Thanks for the uh, presentation. So I'm wondering, like, uh, if you had an oracle in this graph, uh, that means that you essentially don't have stragglers and you have effectively the bad size that you want to have. Like, how close would it be to the, to the red, uh, like, line? If I don't have uh, stragglers and I don't have the... the... 
don't really have uh, any any sample size that you want, right? And they they can do like the ideal part, like not having heterogeneous devices essentially. Or oh, devices so that... yeah, so that will be the yellow. So if we were to just have no stragglers at all, that would just be the uh the yellow. Uh, but then but have the yellow, you have essentially an overselection. That means that right. So to then that will be somewhere between the yellow and the blue line. Yeah, so if there's no heterogeneity at all, probably pretty closer to the blue line, or a little bit, maybe a little bit better than the blue line. But are you considering like the stragglers being the same across all epochs or global rounds? Am I considering all the stragglers being the same? Uh, can you clarify that? Yeah. So essentially, you don't get to see part of the distribution at all. Like some data you will never see, even if you go to like, maximum number of global rounds like because essentially you cannot get this in time because you don't you don't you don't change you don't alter your deadline right like your effective deadline mm -hmm. um like the, the device won't get faster like if we if we say that the device is just like the capability of the device it's not like uh, a transient uh -huh. load uh-huh i don't know because here the stragglers are not simulated. Uh, they are actually how the device behave. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So I'm not. I'm not sure how to answer that. Yeah. Thanks. And maybe I would have one quick question. So, mm -hmm. based on your experience, what's the kind of a right uh, ratio between the C uh, concurrency and core sites? Yeah. So what we find that kind of 10% is a good is a good uh rule or kind of keeping k equal to uh you know 100 uh is 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 a good is a good um kind of uh, heuristic. Thank you. All right. So uh thanks for the questions. Uh I'll just go here for some of the takeaways. Uh Step up is efficient and scalable at high concurrency. Uh, combines the best properties of synchronous and asynchronous FL. Uh, it's robust to stragglers uh, and is amenable to secure aggregation. Um, yep, yeah, thank you for everyone. Um, we have the code to reproduce our experiment in simulation. So we also so we have two papers: one done uh, in simulation, and one in uh, real deployment. The simulation code is here uh, in our federal learning simulator. And the papers are here in these archive links. Uh, and if you have any more questions, uh, you can uh, ask them now or email me at uh, this email address. So. Thank you, John. That was a really excellent talk. So yeah, we have still some time for questions. So in case you have any questions, please just raise your hand or uh, post your question to chat and I'll, I'll try to unmute you. Okay, so we have, yeah, Stefanos has a question. Hi again. Um, another question of mine is like if you if you had any different behaviors across different modalities. So you were talking about text, if I'm not mistaken, right? So yes. like in tasks did you experience any different behavior in terms of like your algorithm or like the hyper parameters that behaved that well yeah so uh uh in our in simulation we did uh text and also uh image and in both in both kind of um, cases uh, we see the same kind of behavior of uh of, uh, of speed up training and not increase in the client resource consumption. So I would have uh, maybe one question that uh, with respect to fairness that uh, was mm -hmm. already mentioned today. So yep. do we actually have uh, any graph maybe? So like uh, what's the like uh, what's the performance across clients that are like faster in terms of computation? Uh, with respect to clients that are like slower because anyway even though like you are asynchronous i mean those faster clients i guess will eventually 
have uh, like a larger contribution to to the overall performance of the model. So so I would expect that they, they still would have a uh, better performance. Yeah, yeah. So are you asking about like kind of this table and then how FedBuff will perform? Yes. Yes, yeah. So uh, actually didn't include it in, in this, but in our paper we did include it. And you we can see that uh, FEPA performs just as well uh, uh, as as kind of the, the vanilla FL approach in with clients with many examples. And okay, so, so you actually don't see any effect of kind of uh, faster or slower clients. Uh, See, so effect of faster and slow client in the sense that the model quality in yes, the top that, that pile differs, yeah. Differs. In a sense yes. that differs from this, like, uh, just this pure FL. Uh, so it's just, it, we, so uh, clients in the top, so what FedBuff is doing is that it has the same kind of uh, uh, score as uh, vanilla FL here. And maybe one other question. So how do you do client selection? Is it uniformly random? From yes, the, it's uniform. Clients? Okay. Yes, it's uniformly random uh, because we don't have any sort of metadata beforehand uh, about the client in order to do any sort of uh, active selection. Okay, so we still have time for maybe one extra question. Oh, and I had, yeah, maybe one more quick question. So uh, I wanted to ask about the target performance that you chose. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it something like relatively high? And for instance, like if you're really optimized for the performance, like how, how does uh, FedBuff compares to federated learning, like standard federated learning, like uh, synchronous federated learning and like centralized, uh, just centralized training? Yeah, so uh, how we pick the target is um, we just see how where the, the, the training curve flattens out and choose a, a, a cutoff point where it's, it's reasonable. Um, so is it relatively high to, to, uh, to, to, to centralize right. training? Yes. Uh, so like, like, as in like close to, to the centralized training uh, target? Um, no, we, we, we had to just cap it. Uh, when 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 there is a, a, a enough long enough uh, flatten out in the in the training curve of sync and of, of sync FL, so we can use sync FL as the as the benchmark, and we kind of mm. give a cutoff after uh, after the curve flatten out. In that setting. Okay. So so you reach at least the same kind of like similar accuracy or performance as you would see in standard sync FL, right? Yes. 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 All right. Yeah. I see. There is a. Another question from Steve. Yeah, please go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, sorry if anybody else wants to ask, like to let, let them go ahead. Um, so my question now is like with respect to adversaries. So imagine the scenario that some client that has been selected can actively participate, select to participate, and uh, like. Um, in a malignant kind of way in your buffered instead of like the synchronous uh, part, right? So that means yeah. that effectively if I sleep like half of the time that I'm supposed to be doing work and I submit like a, a result, that means that I will go to the buffered section. Um, and if an adversary controls like enough devices, I guess that this, this should be like a possible attack. Uh, have you looked at all into this kind of yeah. So, so yeah. So the the, the threat threat model here is uh, honest but curious. We we don't consider Byzantine attacks. Uh, and uh, that attack, you as you mentioned, also you know sync FL with uh, secure allocation also you know yeah. this against that. Yeah. So, but we don't consider against uh, the Byzantine model. Uh, there is one more from 
um, Natalie, <clears throat> let me just try to quick unmute my phone. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me properly? Yes. All right. Um, hi, on the same topic, have you tried other types of defenses besides secure aggregation, such as uh, homomorphic encryption or gradient pruning? Yeah, so we did try uh, differential privacy uh, along with secure aggregation uh, in, in the simulated setting. Uh, and differential privacy provides against uh, the good defenses against um, a wide rate of attacks. Um, so that's why we chose it. Okay, so thanks, Kenjon. Thanks for a great talk. And also, I guess we had a very good discussion. And thank you, everybody, for joining today. And yeah, have a nice rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Goodbye.